you go out there and look at uh, at our Facebook page. That's that makes us look real good. I like and during our speaker uh, period, would you um, mute your yourself until we have the question and answer? Uh, post your question. You can post questions in the in the chat box, but you can also ask questions when when it's opened up for questions. I want to thank Julie for our uh, being our coordinator for today's meeting, and I want to thank Dr. Hallis. She's back, I think. Yes. Okay. Then we're uh, Julie. It's all yours. Well, fellow SHREW members, I have to tell you that Dr. Hallis has one of the most impressive bios I've seen since I've been coming to these SHREW meetings. So I'm going to take a little bit more time than usual just to tell you a little bit about her. She is the Stanley Seymour Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Rice, where she also holds faculty appointments in the departments of physics, chemistry, material science, and nanoengineering and bioengineering, bioengineering. So that's like three, I'm sorry, four or five departments that she's on their faculty. She received her BS degree in chemistry from LaSalle University and her PhD in physics, PhD in physics from Bryn Mawr College. She was a graduate fellow at IBM Yorktown for a PhD research and postdoctoral, a postdoctoral fellow at AT&T Bell Laboratories prior to coming to Rice. She's the author of more than 350 refereed publications, has more than 20 issued patents, and has presented more than 600 invited talks. Two companies have been founded based on her research. Nanospectra Biosciences, which is about photothermal cancer therapy, which is in clinical trials, and Sigi Plasmonics. I didn't pronounce that first name, but it's full of Zs and Xs. And, 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 and well, Z's and Y's. Anyway, plasmonics, which is low temperature photo catalysis, cat, catalysis for sustainable fuels. Sorry, I'm not in the science field. She has been awarded the Frank Isaacson Prize and the Julius Lillenfeld Prize of the American Physical Society and several other important societies, which I, but I won't go through them all. But she's a member of not only the National Academy of Sciences, but the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So she is an incredible researcher and a person who has spanned fields, many different fields to do what she's doing. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hollis to our group today. Thank you very much. So first of all, do you hear me? Wonderful, it's great to see everyone. Thank you so much for this invitation. I love to be able to talk to people locally about the, the work that we do because a lot of the work is local. And what I'm gonna be talking about today are the two, the, exactly what, what Julie referred to a minute ago. And that is the two companies that we started and the technology that came from our lab at Rice into our companies and, and, and going pretty rapidly into the real world. So uh, it's a very exciting for me to talk about this. Uh, to, to talk about our work. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do share screen. And I need to know from you guys if you see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we're able to see. Okay, that's really good. I'm going to try to shrink you guys. And now I'm going to, I need to go into, oh my goodness. I need to, I'm sorry for, for my delay. Um, I need, there we go. Okay. I'm in presentation mode. Do you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. And you see basically Brockman Hall and Brockman Hall is where my office is. It's where uh, physics, uh, a lot of the physics department is. As you all know, since you're alumni, most departments are spread out over several different buildings. So Brockman is this gorgeous building with Penrose tiling on the outside. And there's ECE people here as well. Um, so I'm getting signs to admit people. I'm just going to admit anyone who wants to come. Okay, <clears throat> so here, I don't know how to step this forward now. This is a problem. 
can you click on the slide and then use your keyboard the the right arrow to advance? Oh, click on the slide. That's fine. Yeah, you, you okay. don't need to worry about admitting anybody. I can take care of that for you. Okay, good, because I keep admitting people. I feel like a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to assume that people here that there's a mixture of people that have zero technical background and a mixture, and, and there might be some technical people. So I don't want you know don't offend technical people, but I want to make sure I can engage with people who know nothing about science whatsoever. So <clears throat> I'm going to teach you a little, but only a little. So if you see something very technical, just ignore it. I'm going to tell you the important aspects of this. So so where we start, where my, where my work starts is in a combination of metal particles and light. And these particles are very small, they're nanoparticles, so they're smaller than the width of a human hair. And they are, they have been known, metallic nanoparticles, particularly gold, gold nanoparticles, have been known about, because they have beautiful, beautiful color. The red in the stained glass window, this is of course the rose window from Chartres Cathedral. Uh, the, the, somebody needs to mute because somebody's making a lot of noise. Um, so the so, so the, the beautiful red here is due to gold nanoparticles that are embedded in glass. So they absorb green light, therefore they transmit the complementary color red, and you get this beautiful red, uh, beautiful red color. So the modern era. So the, in fact, it goes even further back than the Middle Ages. The Romans actually had some artisans who knew how to. They didn't know what they were doing. There was no chemistry. It was just alchemy. They knew how to make gold nanoparticles and embed them in glass. So that ancient, ancient technology actually uh, for, went forward through to the Middle Ages and then uh, the alchemy, between the alchemy and chemistry that kind of got lost. But one really important chemist, Michael Faraday, rediscovered it in the 19th century. And he's, um, he was actually, he was involved in two things, making nanoparticles, making gold nanoparticles, but also in understanding light. So our, our modern understanding of electromagnetism, we call them Maxwell's equations, but Faraday was the experimentalist who, is, who, who verified the, them all essentially. And um, he was a great public speaker. So he would make gold nanoparticles. There's a little flask at the bottom of my screen that shows nanoparticles that Michael Faraday made and he would take to his public lectures in a little vial to show people the gold in its in very, very small particulate form is not, doesn't look gold at all, but instead looks, has this beautiful red color. So it's a great illustration to people of how the properties at the nanoscale are very, very different than properties of bulk material. So gold is our favorite uh, example of that. <clears throat> so here is some here, here is some scientific stuff that you can skip, and I will just tell you that <clears throat> the reason that I'm interested, and many, many people are interested in the properties of metal nanoparticles and how they interact with light, is because you can do very, you can have do some very strong effects when you shine uh, light onto metal nanoparticles. <clears throat> so one thing you can do. So the, so the metal particles, just as I showed you with gold, so gold absorbs green light. If you shine green light on a gold particle, it will heat up the particle. It will heat up its local environment. And so, so very, very strong photothermal heating effects happen between light and nanoparticles. Another thing that nanoparticles can do if, if you shine light on them is they can actually do chemistry. If there's molecules sitting on the surface of the particle, when you shine light, electrons can be emitted from the particle to the molecules and they can make them, for example, dissociate, decompose. And so you can make chemistry happen using just light and nanoparticles. And for us, that's been the exciting, the two exciting foundations of some work that we've done. So photothermal applications and what we call photocatalysis is, um, are, are, are the two physical effects that we use for our different companies. So the first story I'm going to tell you is about photothermal cancer therapy. And it's a, it's a story that started 20 years ago. We never thought that when we started this, it would take 20 years for this to go, actually more than 20, 25 years ago, that it would take so long for us to go from uh, the nanoparticle actually to the application to humans and to changing people's lives. <clears throat> so what happens, so I showed you what happened, the gold nanoparticles absorb green light. Right? That's my main, my, was my initial message. Well, if you change the shape of gold nanoparticles, you can 
teach them, you can coax them to absorb other wavelengths of light. And it turns out that light that's not green, but light that is red or just around the reddish region of the spectrum, so it's technically called the near infrared, but it's this dull red region of the spectrum, it penetrates through the body. If you've ever been in an emergency room and somebody clips a little clip on your finger to monitor your, the oxygen in your blood, that's red light. And you can see it passes right through your fingertip. So it's that same transmissivity of light when it's a, a red wavelengths that actually opens the door to uh, using light to do to probe the human body and also to do therapy. <clears throat> so what we did was figure out a way to make nanoparticles that absorb red light instead of green light. And that, those are particles we call nanoshells. So we make them basically hollow instead of solid particles. And so that opened the door to what we can, what, what, to what we call it, in, in bioengineering terms or biomedical terms, the water window. So those are the wavelengths that can, that can pass much further through the body than, for example, green light, which absorb right, right in the first cell will absorb only green light, first layer of cells. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is a foundation for what we could then use for applications. And I worked on this with a bioengineer. This was started, as I said, back around, well, the first cancer therapy work we did was, was 20 years ago, 2003. And I, I was the nanoparticle maker. She knew all about mice. She was a bioengineer. And so together we had this idea that if you took nanoparticles and you put them in a, can in a tumor, <clears throat> that you should then be able to absorb, pass light into that tumor. And only where the nanoparticles are, you would induce photothermal heating, which could kill cancer cells. So it'd be a very, very localized way to kill only the cells in a tumor and not any remain adjoining cells. So we're very excited about that. We tried the experiment. She brought the rats. We brought the nanoparticles. We called them nanoshells. <clears throat> and what we did was very simple. We inject them into the tail of a mouse. They circulate through the body of the mouse. So after a, a certain period of time, like an hour or two, and then we shine just a very simple tabletop laser through the tumor. And the particles then that are have, have taken up naturally in a tumor, so that's a well-known biological process, a well-known property of, of tumors that they will collect particles. <clears throat> Those particles might contain drugs. In some cases, this is no drugs, it's just it's gold particles instead. It will collect particles in the tumor over time. And then when you shine light, you heat only the particles inside the tumor. And so you can cause tumor remission. So these photographs that I have at the bottom of my, of, of my screen are a photograph of a, of a tumor on a mouse the day of treatment on day zero and then the tumor 12 days later. So there's a little, a little skin damage that sloughs off in about two weeks. So basically we found that using this method, we could induce tumor remission. We could basically have the tumors disappear on virtually all of the mice. And that was actually very exciting because normally when people do studies with mice and cancer, the mice die and none of our mice died at all. So we had to actually, it caused an economic crisis. We had to figure out how do we feed and house these mice for their natural lifetimes because they were all going to survive our therapy. So that made, that was very exciting for us. And that allowed us to then, uh, to, to move forward and to <clears throat> start a company. And that was Nanospectra Biosciences. <clears throat> and then gradually move through different mouse studies, safety studies, and then eventually into humans. So it actually went, so, so our nanoparticle, this type of, Photothermal cancer therapy that I'm showing you here started um, in 2008 in humans, and we had a trial in head and neck cancer at that point. And then in 2010, we had a trial in prostate cancer. The trial was actually in Mexico City, and the trial didn't go that well. And it was kind of strange for us to, 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 to find out. So <clears throat> let me tell you first a little bit about prostate cancer. <clears throat> so prostate cancer is an extremely common cancer, the only more common cancer in men is skin cancer. So skin cancer, prostate cancer, and of course, lung cancer is also a, a, a very common, <clears throat> but it is, it is the second most deadly cancer to lung cancer in men. It is one in nine men will be diagnosed during their lifetime of prostate cancer. And three if you have a, 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 near, a primary relative with prostate cancer, then the risks are three times more likely. So it's something that all men, all families need to be very, very aware of because it's so, it's so very prevalent. And I'm very, my personal story is my father, I don't have him anymore, but my dad was diagnosed in his 80s with prostate cancer. So I know very, very much about 
the conventional treatments. So <clears throat> conventional diagnosis is uh, exam by a doctor, and then you go to, you get a T PSA level checked. So prostate specific antigen. So when the PSA level is elevated, <clears throat> then they perform something called a needle biopsy where they go in and they, they put needles into the prostate and they try to identify whether or not there is cancerous, whether, whether there are tumors inside the prostate. <clears throat> so once that is accomplished, if they decide that this is, uh, the, 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 the cancer is indeed there and they need to, uh, to do therapy, then <clears throat> What they'll often do is they'll they'll just follow the follow the process to see if the PSA level is elevated further, or if there are any further symptoms, and then if uh, therapy is uh, is considered, then usually it starts with for earlier stage cancer radiation treatment, and then surgery, chemotherapy for advanced cancer, advanced prostate cancer. So the problem with these therapies, as you probably well know, is that they have side effects, and the side effects are really are, are really damaging to the quality of life. So incontinence and, and, and ED are very, very common uh, when you use conventional therapies. And that's actually very scary to most people. And so I mentioned before that we did this nanoshell uh, photothermal therapy in, back in 2010 to 2012, and it didn't work out too well. And there's a real simple reason why. <clears throat> so before 2012, if you tried to image the prostate in a human body, it would look like what I'm showing you here, like a blob. You can see the prostate, but you can't see anything inside it. And so it took a breakthrough from a completely different field, the field of MRI imaging and ultrasound, image processing, where they actually use images taken in an MRI tube, and then ultrasound images that are taken in the clinic, and they combine both of them, and they can actually then get very, very high resolution images of the, of, of, of the tissue inside of a prostate, uh, a, a prostate gland. And so you can, they can very easily visualize the lesions. This is considered a tremendous breakthrough and it was a, a initially applied and it's now extensively applied to biopsy. So rather than having just blindly putting needles into the prostate gland, they use this imaging method to only put the needles in exactly where the tissue is suspect. So they can target the regions where they are most concerned about, about being a suspect, uh, about having, <coughs> ha ha having, having tumors within the gland. This increased, it was with a true breakthrough in urology, in neurological oncology, where they actually, uh, they increased the number of correct diagnoses by more than 50%. So <coughs> what a tremendous breakthrough. So then now we add something to, to conventional diagnosis, and now we call this fusion guided biopsy, which is far, far more accurate. And the fellow who invented this is a young guy, still a young guy. <clears throat> he was actually, when he developed the fusion guided biopsy, he was actually, he was not a, a, a professor yet. He was, a, he was a urologist, he was at NIH and he was working on the technology, which now is part of Philips and Siemens MRI uh, equipment. So it's commercially available, it's widespread, <clears throat> but he was, he, so, so he got together with someone else, Stephen Canfield, and Stephen Canfield is here in Houston at the UT Health Sciences Center, and he's also a urologist, and Stephen knew about our photothermal th therapy. So he met with Art, and he said, you know, if you can put in a biopsy needle, you can also put in an optical fiber, and if the particles are there in the tumor, you should be able to very selectively ablate them, destroy just the tumor tissue inside the prostate gland, which is very, very uh, has to be very, very precise. And so, so together they uh, developed this, uh, developed this method. Let me see if I can, here we go. So, <clears throat> so we, we call the photothermal cancer therapy that I showed you with mice if you practices in people. It has a commercial name called Oralase therapy. And so what's really great about it is you can, you can do the procedure I, really virtually identical to what I showed you in a mouse, except of course we don't have tails but you can do, do an injection of the nanoparticles in a mouse. Uh, and it's the first therapy that you can do. So if that for some reason wouldn't work, it doesn't, it doesn't restrict you from doing all of the other more conventional therapies if they're in fact needed. So, so uh, this uh, clinical procedure was developed completely based on a biopsy. And this is a, a, an image of, on the right, you see an image of, a, of, of one of the patients in the clinical trial 
And what you see are several probes that are inserted into the prostate tumor. And so on the left, you see a little diagram of what those red dots are actually these optical fiber probes. And each one delivers light into a region of the, uh, of the prostate. And if you can see where, exactly where the tumor is, and if you just look at this, at, at the cartoon on the left, and you look at the scale, right, you can see that this is very, very valuable real estate here. You cannot, this is high precision work. You cannot be away from <coughs> you know, one centimeter too far, and you actually can cause uh, serious, serious damage to other important organs and important organ systems. So the precision of ultra-localized therapy is what really makes this procedure work very, very well. So I'm going to play you an a, a, a story that Stephen Canfield just uh, recorded. The side effects of treatment are well known. A man may be afraid of becoming impotent or becoming Can you increase the volume? Yes. Dr. Hollis? Yes? Um, it is a little bit difficult to hear. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So did the video play? Yes, the video played. The audio is just a little bit difficult to hear. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, I apologize. So, um, okay. So 
oops, let me go back for a second. So, um, okay, pretty good. Just to wrap up this story. So basically, yes? I'm sorry. Okay, to wrap up this story, the, the, the clinical trial is over, it ended in uh, the, around the end of 2021 in October. The last patients were treated for the second phase. There are only two phases of this trial. And now the last, the, the data from the last cohort of patients is coming in and the data looks extremely promising with very high success rates. So year one was 94%, it's now lower than that, it's about 85%, but that's still really considered very, very positive. And right now the treatment is being practiced in nine locations in the United States. So we're really anticipating that, um, that, that FDA approval should be pretty straightforward and happening sometime in this calendar year. So next topic, completely different topic. But we're all thinking a lot about energy these days, and uh, especially in Houston, right? This is the energy city, and we all know we're going through an energy transition. And if we think about, so I have, I have a, an image on my screen that is uh, basically Dow Chemical Plant in Freeport, Texas, very, very large chemical plant. They consume an amazing amount of energy, and they consume basically fossil fuels to heat and to run chemical reactions and if we compare the different industries uh, that, and their energy consumption, what's really stunning is that the chemical industry uh, is the worst, is the, the highest con energy consumer of all industries. And this is something to be, you know, really, they're, they're of course very, very concerned about this. This is, we all pay, pay this cost, right? When we buy anything that's made out of plastics or anything derived from petroleum, petroleum, excuse me, and the, and, and the uh, uh, chemicals made from that, then this is something that, that impacts, impacts us all. So uh, usually, so, so why, are, why are chemical plants so big? The reason they're so big is because these processes that they run are thermal in nature, so they need to have a big stainless steel uh, containers for very, very high degree, um, uh, very, very high temperature processes. And, um, and, and they are inefficient, relatively inefficient processes. And so they take advantage of economy of scale and make very, very large quantities of all of the commodity chemicals that they, that they use. <clears throat> so it's a huge industry, as we know from Houston. Um, and the, so the economics is, is, is massive, but so are the emissions. So they're responsible for a lot of, of, of emissions. And if we really want to dramatically reduce emissions, then we need to um, look at very, very new ways to do chemistry. So I mentioned earlier in my talk, so metal nanoparticles, if we shine light on them, they can actually inject uh, an, an electron into, say, a molecule sitting on their surface. And that can cause the molecule to dissociate. So that's a really good kind of chemistry to do. Instead of heating up the molecule to make it dissociate, you actually uh, can just uh, put in a, uh, put, put, add an electron and that makes the molecule sufficiently unstable that it will just break apart. So you can ignore the science. Let me just show you in the cartoon how that happens. <clears throat> so if we show, so this is an example of a very simple molecule, two atoms, H2, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen molecule. Very, very important molecule because this could be the source of clean energy going forward. So <clears throat> what happens if I take these nanoparticles and I flow them along the surface of say a gold nanoparticle and then I excite the, the gold nanoparticle with green light, right? That particle then absorbs energy and then it, yes, it can cause photothermal effects but more importantly for this molecule, it can actually inject an electron into the molecule so we fly, flow this over the surface, it only weakly associates with the gold atoms, but if we shine light, we can inject an electron into the molecule itself, and that can dissociate the molecule at room temperature. Normally, this is a very high temperature process, but here we can do it at room temperature. <clears throat> so we can also, so the problem with gold is that nothing sticks to gold. As we know, gold doesn't oxidize. You can have gold jewelry for decades and decades, and gold is just impervious to chemistry. It's what chemists would call boring. <clears throat> but gold interacts with light. So to do chemistry, we can combine a particle like gold, also, so, so properties of copper and aluminum are, and silver is the same way. They interact very strongly with light, but they're pretty lousy uh, for, for doing chemistry, for grabbing onto molecules. 
but we figured out that we can take a particle that interacts with light and then on it we can put uh, we can put little atoms or clusters of molecules that are really good at interacting I'm sorry of, of elements that are really good at interacting with molecules so the catalysts in industry are things called the platinum group metals. They're very, very rare, like the platinum catalytic converters in your cars. And people steal them because the platinum is so incredibly, incredibly valuable. <clears throat> but this is, you know, so we can we can combine both of these ideas, optics and chemistry, and we can build new catalysts this way. So we call them antenna reactors because a particle actually acts like an antenna, only it's an antenna for light. And then we have special chemical handles that we can grab molecules with. <clears throat> so we've done this for several different types of, uh, of what we call antenna reactors and just showing you some different chemical reactions. We're not going to go into any of the chemistry here, but <clears throat> I do want to mention a really, really, really important reaction. So I'm sorry, there's so much, so much science here, <clears throat> but if you just below where at the below where I say methane dry reforming reaction, I have a, chem a chemical equation that shows you two molecules that get changed into two other molecules. <clears throat> so these are, this is one of the most important reactions that, on the planet. So what this is, is methane and CO2, carbon dioxide, those are both greenhouse gases. They contribute to global to climate change. <clears throat> and we can convert those to CO, which is a molecule we can do other things with, but also we can convert it to hydrogen. This is how most of the hydrogen on the planet, which gets used in many, many ways. This is how most of the hydrogen is made. And it, it's, it's done at really high temperatures. And it is, so it's very expensive to make hydrogen. We'd have hydrogen fuel if it wasn't four times more expensive than gasoline. So if, you could, if we could figure out a way to reduce the cost of hydrogen, then hydrogen vehicles would, hydrogen engines would, fuel cell engines would, pop, would, would, would power our, our trucks, our our trains, our airplanes, most of the weight of an airplane is actually the fuel. So hydrogen fuel would be uh, revolutionary and, and many other uh, transportation industries and other industries too. So I'm showing you another chart here. I don't want <clears throat> to go into the, 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 the details here at all, but just to tell you that we can actually do methane reforming, which is what that reaction is called, making hydrogen using light instead of using heat. So when we do this with light, it's a, it's a little bit above room temperature, but only a few hundred, only about 200 degrees Celsius, 300 degrees Celsius. You can, as you could get, you could run that reaction literally in your oven at home in a glass container, in a plastic container, if you had the right light source. So I'm going to play another video. I hope this, I hope this runs. Lisa is very. Dr. Hallis, can you turn up the volume? Turn it up? Yeah, we need more sound. Oh, let me see if I can do that. Ah, uh, Dr. Hallis, I have another suggestion too that you might try. If you stop sharing your screen um, and then go back to share your screen, you can click a button that, that uh, lets you share the audio and that might work out a little bit better. Let's see if we can do that. It'll say uh, share sound and optimize for video clip. And you'll just wanna select both of those options. Oh, you are a pro at this, thank you. I try. <laughs> Oh, that's fabulous. Okay, let's see if we can go back to this. Let's see if that works. Share. Okay. Oh, now I don't hear him at all. Do you hear him? No. No. <laughs> Let me start at the beat. No. That's, that's unfortunate. I see a mute button here. Okay, that might work. Let's see if this works. This material represents a revolutionary breakthrough for science. It is a highly specialized photocatalyst, and it allows us to perform chemical reactions with light. This means that we do not have to burn fuel, which helps us to reduce emissions. And we can use simple materials like glass and plastic, which helps to reduce cost. 
Using this technology, CCG has developed a small-scale distributed hydrogen producing system that dramatically reduces the cost of hydrogen for our customers. Perhaps the most interesting of these customers are hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. When we bring our first product to market, it will be capable of producing hydrogen fuel at a price point so low it can compete with gasoline. For every semi-truck, forklift, or passenger vehicle that we enable to switch from gasoline to hydrogen, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by several tons per year. By making low-cost green hydrogen, we are helping the world take a strong step in the right direction. The hydrogen industry needs a novel technology to help it reach its true potential. Syzygy Plasmonics is here to provide that pioneering new technology. Okay, so that was a that that was a, a, a bit of a preview. That was actually Syzygy in the early days, Syzygy Plasmonics in the early days, with about five employees. Now they have forty five employees, and uh, they are making kilograms of hydrogen every day. They're trying to figure out how to go from kilograms to tons, and so you can. This is a, an illustration of of the difference between when you run a chemical reaction using heat on the left compared to when you run it using light. And the light that we use is not sunlight. The light that we use is, um, is solid state lighting, LEDs. So they're a very, very efficient way of converting electricity to light. So um, the, so, yes, so, uh, very good. So let me show you a little bit more about the, uh, about the, Syzygy's Raptor. Syzygy's photocatalyst is a nanoparticle system that is made up of two parts. It is composed of a larger, light harvesting plasmonic nanoparticle, which is covered with much smaller catalyst nanoparticles. Photons are made using high efficiency LEDs, and these photons interact with the plasmonic nanoparticle to produce plasmons which in turn energize the catalyst nanoparticles. This interaction causes the catalyst to generate high energy electrons that are able to make or break chemical bonds. Inside of Syzygy's reactor, this basic process of using photons to perform chemical reactions happens more than one trillion times per second. Ultimately, this is how our chemical reactors work. So, as I said, they're very, they're progressing very quickly from making kilogram, kilograms of hydrogen to using electricity, right? Use, using electricity and converting it to light uh, to, um, to, to tons of hydrogen. So uh, this is a, 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 a very big breakthrough in terms of uh, our needs for hydrogen, in terms of lowering the cost for hydrogen there's a magical number of a dollar per kilogram and they're very rapidly approaching that in their economic analysis. So we're very excited about this idea. So being able to make hydrogen at low temperature also means you don't need a big chemical plant. You can make it in a small, uh, a, a small module that you could actually have at every gas station. So hydrogen fuel vehicles is something that really becomes a much more economic reality. And if we can tip the economic scales towards hydrogen, that will really change how things work. So I've been able to tell you about two, uh, two, two breakthroughs in our laboratory, which over the years have been able to uh, move out of um, move out of our laboratory and then into uh, the real world. And this is Art Rastenhod with the with patient number one. Uh, Art's in New York City and he is um, and, and he, he is he's now a, gotten promoted. He's associate uh, of department chair at his new hospital, Northwell Health in Manhattan. And now he's having developing several different suites where they will all be practicing photothermal cancer therapy of the prostate. And our newer technology that's moving along very, very rapidly that we're very excited about. And that is the, com the combination of our metal nanoparticles and light driven reactors for uh, making hydrogen at a, a more economic scale than ever imagined before. So with that, I wanna thank you so much and I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Um, Dr. Hallis, this is Julie Connor. 
I'm thinking maybe if you could go back to your first video and replay it because we did we really couldn't hear what was being said. I think okay. people might appreciate having a chance to hear that video. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about not having the, uh, my system optimized, but I'm happy to play this video. The side effects of treatment are well known. Uh, a man may be afraid of becoming impotent or becoming incontinent at a young age and therefore never seek treatment, never seek screening and present with the cancer too late. And so I'm working for all of my patients who, who know uh, there are better things on the horizon and better treatments coming. Well, it started, I guess, about two, two, two and a half years ago. I came and saw Dr. Canfield and, and they said, well, you know, it's this kind of tumor. It's sort of one of those that's sort of serious. It isn't serious. And he laid out all the options of the different kinds of things that could happen. Suddenly his face changed and he had this twinkle in his eye and he said, but you know, there's one other thing that you could try. And then he informed me of his treatment was the gold nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles absorb a color of light that passes uh, very easily through the human body. So if they're placed in a tumor or if they collect in the tumor naturally, if you shine light on that tumor, the light will pass through the tissue and will be absorbed by the nanoparticles. They convert the light to heat and they locally ablate just the cells very, very close to the nanoparticles themselves. The technology is innovative because it's it's unique. We, we are putting an inert nano shell in the human body, uh, taking advantage of natural tumor biology to, to localize the shell at the tumor site, and then lighting it up with laser energy to create you know cell death. For types of cancer, like prostate cancer, that require a very ultra-localized approach, this approach is absolutely ideal. It is so non-invasive to the patient that it's really, it's really game-changing. Patients, they feel guilty sometimes. I've had patients tell me, I feel guilty that I got to do this when I know so many men who weren't able to participate in this trial or had never heard of it. As far as I was concerned, it was, it was excellent. It was a matter of simply all outpatient care, no complications, no pain, no discomfort. And at the end of it, you know, a year went by and my PSA is back to normal. My MRI is basically normal. And uh, at the present time, I'm cured. To date, the clinical trial has been very successful. The goals of the trial being treatment of prostate cancer in a focal and localized manner with minimal to no side effects, at least not the standard ones of urinary control or sexual function, uh, have all proven to be true. The technology works, so it's all very encouraging, and I do see a pathway in the future that this will be a commonly used procedure. I am so happy to see this wonderful treatment now being uh, pursued so successfully and really changing men's lives for the better. Any man who is offered the chance to have a focal treatment to get rid of his cancer rather than a radical treatment of his prostate with all of the side effects that come with that jumps at the chance. In fact, anybody who's been a candidate for this trial has not turned down the opportunity to participate. And that's because um, it is so compelling. It sounds too good to be true, but it really does work. The University of Texas is an incredibly supportive environment, allowing us to do our work with patients, but also innovative research like this. So we the side effects of Thank you, Dr. Hollis. I'm going to take the, um, the, the chance and ask the first question. I first saw a report in some Rice publication about this work you're doing on prostate cancer. And my immediate thought was, can the same technology be applied to breast cancer? Yes. <clears throat> this could be applied to many different cancers. The, the reason, so it's, so, Entering into this area, seeing our work go from the lab to the clinic introduced us to a lot of the economics and politics of how things become, uh, be, you know, be, become um, accepted treatment by medical uh, community. <clears throat> right now, there is an accepted an accepted treatment for breast cancer, and that is surgery and reconstructive surgery. And so, there, the question is: Would is, is this? Um, it, 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 you'd have to, you'd have to, how can I say, you, you'd have to sell the medical community that this was 
somehow better economically than the current treatment. So that might sound rather harsh, but that's the, the sort of, this is all really about the economics, unfortunately. Um, where we've beginning to realize that this is so, so for example, with prostate cancer, because this is, there are no alternatives. I mean, the alternatives are really all associated with, with a severe loss of quality of life. And so urologists are very excited about this. In fact, that video that Stephen Canfield made was being played at the urology conference to teach urologists about this. So they're very, very excited about this. They're sort of pulling the, the application into the clinic because of their enthusiasm. And when there are alternative treatments, doctors say, well, this is already what I have. I have the, you know, I, I have the training in this area. I have the, you know, the, the facilities and so on for this. What is it, what is about this that would actually allow you to, to, to move forward? So when we look at how you could actually translate something into medical practice, you have to look for these niches where, um, you know, where, where there, there are no alternatives or where the, you know, where there's real, you know, uh, uh, currently there are real technological issues. And I would certainly love to see this used for, for, for breast cancer. It is of course far less invasive, but you're, 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 it, it, it would be a challenge for people to, um, to, to persuade that entire community that this is somehow demonstrably better than the things that they're doing now every day. Well, I'll just say as a breast cancer survivor, between what I went through the whole course, that is chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. And many years later, I still am suffering from side effects, side effects like lymphedema and neuropathy. So clearly something that doesn't cause the side effects is also, besides losing your breast, I haven't even mentioned losing your breast. Exactly. Uh, besides that, um, I, I can't imagine if given the option, women wouldn't go for this technology. I, co I completely agree. I, I, I'm not a breast cancer survivor myself, but I know so many people. And one, you know, the, the, one of the problems is that the way that people assess treatment is survivability. They don't put quality of life as the primary concern. They're put survivability, which in a, you know, that's very good. Right? You want your patients to survive, number one. But then beyond that, there are no, there, there, there are no degradation, there, there are no sort of gradations, excuse me, of of uh, you know what's less invasive or more invasive, quality of life is not does not factor in nearly as much as uh, as, as, as sur survivability. So until that changes, if that can change, I mean clearly I th the urologists see that there's a pathway to changing that um, for 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 prostate cancer because anyone who's had a radical prostatectomy you know is uh, you know clearly feels that there must be a better way. Um, that 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 journey has not really started with the breast cancer community. And when we first started this, of course, I mean, Jennifer and I are both women. We immediately assumed that this would, this would be an automatic thing for breast cancer. And we were surprised of the pushback that we got because there was already these standard therapies that are considered, you know, they're standard and they're available and they're very effective. And that's what the standard for effectiveness is. Well, again, I'll just say, it's effective, but it was, I was with cancer treatment for a full year, every day, over and over, trips to the hospital to do this and that. And, the, and then after that, the lasting side effects. So I'm really amazed that the medical profession hasn't gotten behind that. Yes. Um, meanwhile, so let me I. ask, uh, Nancy Bailey has a question for you. Nancy, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I have a friend who has a real advanced lung cancer with like a hundred tumors in his lungs. And it's just like, we're just waiting, kind of. Would there be any way to target those tumors in lung cancer? So that, um, yes, I do believe so. Um, there were, uh, one of so one of the reasons that, so, so, so basically this, can, this could be applied to all cancer. The question is who's gonna go from the, who's gonna actually develop the, the, the clinical procedure to do this. So then you go to the FDA or you go to NIH and you say, will you approve a clinical trial 
for this particular thing. And they look very carefully at the protocol. One of the problems is that the lung has a lot of blood vessels. And they were very worried that there could be some interference with if you, if you begin to ablate tumors in a region where there's a, a large amount of, uh, of, of, of blood circulation, then um, that could cause some clear, clear you know, problems in, in terms of uh, bleeding within the patient. So, um, so, so that they, they actually tried to, they proposed a protocol and it was not accepted for, for trial. So hopefully in the future, this could be used for lung cancer because that's a, obviously very, very common cancer that would be great target. So, but it's not at, at the current time being developed. So the type of cancer, because this is, you know, we've had so much success now with this very localized type of cancer, right? In the, within the prostate, there's also other, other cancers, retinal cancer, which requires ultra localized therapy, also thyroid cancers. Uh, so there are some targets that are similar enough organ systems where the treatment has to be very, very localized and where alternative treatments are uh, really deleterious that are, are sort of the next steps in terms of how this, the, the, this type of therapy can, can be advanced. Sylvia, you have a question or maybe it's just a comment you'd like to offer? It was just a comment uh, and, um, that uh, men, men are mostly making these decisions on what's important and what is, I mean, because the prostrate, prostrate state decision was made on quality of life issues, not survivability. So it's, yeah, it's just a matter of opinion. <laughs> oh, I, I agree completely, I agree completely. I mean, look at all the drugs we have for heart disease. This is because Congress decided that they put a lot of money into it because men used to have a lot more heart attacks, right? So men don't have heart attacks anymore because of all the drugs and all the advancements that, that we have, have done uh, counterbalancing heart disease. I, I mean, I would say the, the rate of heart disease is, is reduced and the amount of, of alternative treatments are, you know, has, has really, really advanced that field. So um, uh, yeah, I agree. Okay, I'm waiting to see more questions in the chat line. Meanwhile, I'll just throw another one out there for you, Dr. Hallis. So the hydrogen work seems to me incredibly important and I'm just amazed it's not better, well, better known out in the public. There's an awful lot of conversation about using electric cars, for example, but why isn't there conversation about using hydrogen powered cars? Why, why isn't that happening? So there, so so there is in industry. So there are there and in other countries, and I can say a little bit more about that in a, in a second. But one of the one of the so I'm not going to say anything bad about about electric vehicles. But one of the problems, if you look at this in terms of of of, of climate change or climate impact, is that your electric cars are only as green as your electricity is. So for example, China made this huge commitment to have electric cars, but virtually all of the electricity in China is made with coal powered, coal, coal fired power plants. And so it's very, very dirty electricity. So if China electrifies their roads, they will actually create more greenhouse gases than if they used hydrocarbons, in which they actually will. So what, you know, the, Politicians, I mean, this is the simple solution, right? You know about Tesla, you know about electric vehicles. So, so of course, the, you know, politicians, they don't know any of the technology or they're not comparing technologies. So of course, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything partisan or whatever, I'm not, this is not political comment at all, but all politicians, right? Well, we want electric vehicles, we want electrification. And so, but, but you have to understand where does the electricity come from? See the whole entire picture. And so, um, you know, there's also arguments there regarding hydrogen, but this way of making hydrogen is actually amazing because we're taking two greenhouse gases and methane is actually 25 times more dangerous than CO2. All you hear about is CO2, right? Carbon dioxide, uh, you know, pro problems with, 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 you know, greenhouse gas emissions, but methane is far, far more dangerous. And so <clears throat> there, you know, this, so this is very, very promising in that, in, in that regard. Now, why there is, um, so, so, so one thing I was going to mention in some countries, so for example, Japan is very, very focused on hydrogen because they have no oil and gas themselves, right? So they have no fossil fuel alternatives. So they're very, very interested in hydrogen. 
and that they are back of the the, the, the commercial vehicles, passenger vehicles that you can purchase now, you can buy a hydrogen fuel cell passenger vehicle, but they're all made in Japan. So Toyota and Mazda both make them. Wow. You've given us an awful lot to think about, Dr. Hollis. And I guess I, as a Rice graduate, I'm proud of Rice's con contributions in these areas, but I'm I'm also sad that they aren't wide, more widely known and being put into use. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so, so people have been working on hydrogen for a long time. In fact, the city of Los Angeles is just committed to having hydrogen buses, but their way of making hydrogen is splitting water and there's not an efficient process. It has to be heavily subsidized by the government. The issue is if you can reduce, if you can break the, down to the dollar a kilogram threshold, and actually get below um, below below uh, 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 fossil fuel costs for vehicles, then that will actually change you know, that that will change the economics. When I uh, did your bio, I mentioned that you've done over two hundred uh, six hundred talks to people. Have you done TED talks, for example, on these topics? I I, I would love to do one. I was invited several years ago. But I was I had another commitment, so I was not able to do it. But I would I'd like to do a TED talk, that's for sure. Well, I encourage you to try to get yourself scheduled on either <laughs> or both of these topics because they're fascinating. Um, and they would make improve life for so many people. The the cancer issue for you know just your health, and then the whole pop, world's population on the hydrogen issue. Thank you. Okay, does no one else has put a question in the chat line, but does anyone want to ask the last question? Raise your hand if you've got your, your if we can see you, and if not, just. Well, I do, this is Karin, and I do want to take a moment and thank you so very much. This is just the most enlightened hour or 40 minutes that I've spent in a long, long time. I appreciate you so much. Let's give Dr. Hallis a hand. And we're so happy you could be with us today. And, and thank you, Julie, for uh, inviting her and coordinating things so that we got this wonderful information. I wanna remind you that next week, oh, Michael, do you have something to say? I did have a question for uh, Professor Hollis. Okay. Uh, so, there's been some discussion about the buildup of microparticles as well as nanoparticles in the environment. We don't really know the long-term effects, both on the environment and on organisms. So I'm kind of curious, when you do the study inside uh, in vivo and pe people, uh, was there thought about, and I was curious if you had done it with the mice, were there plans to remove the particles afterwards would they remain localized at the point of treatment and you wouldn't really worry about it or would they redistribute in the body? So what has been the follow-up on that? I'm sure you've thought about it. Are there, can you say anything about the long-term effects? Yeah, so, yes, so, uh, so first of all, the particles, uh, so dur during this long period where we were developing the, from the, of the laboratory where we make nanoparticles through mouse trials and then to, to humans, of course, nanotoxicology became a very, very big concern. And so we've done, you know, about five years worth of work on studying extensively whether these particles would have any kind of deleterious uh, effect. So they are absolutely safe. That's why they're in humans. They do leave the body slowly. They leave through the bile, through the liver. So through the fecal matter. Over a, over a long period of time. So it's not like a drug that's out of your system in, a, in, in a, a matter of a few hours, but they seem to have absolutely no deleterious effect. The, the, if, if, a, if, a, if a clinician misses a tumor, they can actually go back and retreat the tumor so they can re-suspend the nanoparticles in the body and they can retreat the tumor. So there are no, um, there are no problems with this. That's also a point, I mean, obviously we're very concerned about about uh, the different toxins in our or carcinogens in our environment that we're that, that we're exposed to, but I think that a lot of the nano, if you compare sort of the the 
the, the safety issues that people feel com, or, or involve nanoparticles. Well, we know one bad nanoparticle, that's asbestos, right? But but if you compare those to all of the other chemicals that we're exposed to on a daily basis that are in our drinking water, that is in our food, that, you know, that, that I'm far less worried about nanoparticles, certainly not worried about particles that, like these that have undergone years of testing relative to things that might be in our, um, you know, be, be in our soil and taken up by plants, be in our, our, our groundwater. Uh, there are, you know, many other things that I'd be far more concerned about that are far more potent, for example, carcinogens. So uh, we actually, uh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's another hour long talk, but I'm not going <laughs> we'll to. We'll have to have you back. Um, uh, that was a good question, Michael. Yay, nanoparticles. Um, Can I ask a follow up to that too? Sure, Michael. Well, we're running out of time. They're going oh, okay. to turn still, us off. <laughs> so, okay. I bet you you can uh, send Dr. Hallis an email and okay. she'll answer your question. Um, uh, next week, we're going to have another member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Anthony Penn. So a double whammy from the Arts and Sciences. Um, um, and I hope to see you all next Monday, 12 o'clock for our little social hour and, a, and maybe a, a line or two of business and then followed by Dr. Penn. Y'all have a great photo, day. photo, photo. Oh, right. gosh, yes. Dr. Hallis, don't leave us. <laughs> She's gone. Did she? <sighs> Looks like it. Oh, darn. I'm sorry. Amanda? Yes, I'm ready for the photo. I'll count it down. Everyone who doesn't have their 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 camera on, please turn it on for the for the photo.